Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the new monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss augmented analytics explained. A couple of points to get us started due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find the icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing the links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce the speaker of this monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of expertise, is dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data, analytics, and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision-making, and streamline operations. Nick is recognized for his adeptness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello, my friend. Hey, Mark. Thanks for the nice uh, intro as always. And welcome, everybody. I see people are filtering in. I'm super excited about um, this particular one. One. It's the first one I'm doing um, with my own company, which I just started, which is Data Positive. And two, I think augmented analytics is something that is like even more nebulous <laughs> in our industry than anything else. So appreciate the intro. Uh, see people filtering in, uh, which is great. So let's talk a little. Let's get into it because I have a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about today. So first of all, um, Virginia, love it. Um, used to live in Richmond, Virginia for a while. So what to expect here? And you can already see what I'm doing here. As Ned just said one thing, I latched right onto it because I encourage interaction throughout. People don't have to show their faces. You know, you don't have to do anything you don't want to. Oh, can everybody hear? Mark, can you hear yeah. me okay? Yeah, I can hear you loud and okay. clear. All right. Ulrich, you might have a little bit of a little thing with your sound there because unfortunately my nasally voice is broadcasting um but you can see i will look at the chat and i will um you know ask you guys for some interaction if you're comfortable with it through the chat um it's going to be an informal style i actually had a really good like you know instead of dad jokes it could be dat data jokes um i didn't do that but i will try to kind of keep it light this can be it's dense and it can be confusing and it can be boring, as we all know, as data professionals for the most part. So I'm going to try to keep it a little bit light. And when you do see these these question marks, um, there will be an opportunity for you to kind of say something. And it's just me trying to understand more about who I'm talking to, because it feels like talking into a void. So first one, and I know most of you are going to identify as a data professional, but hopefully we have some business users. Hopefully we have some leaders. So who are you? Who's here? And if you don't mind just typing into the the chat, like and type it to everybody, just so everybody kind of knows who we are. But are you a data professional? Are you a business user? Are you a leader? Are you a little bit of two or three? You know, let me know in the chat because I would love to see who we're talking about it. Yeah, all of the above. Perfect. Yes. And I think Mark has probably the coolest title, which is data evangelist. And I, I think that's all of these basically. Solution architect in Toronto, perfect. Data nerd, perfect. Oh, Helen, I'm glad we have a marketing automation manager here. Cool. So we got like a nice little um, mix of folks. And really what I try to do here is I try to, the reason I ask is because I wanna know if I do a good job today. So as a data professional, you know, here are, here's my objective. I want you to understand, you know, how it can automate data preparation, this whole, this nebulous thing called augmented analytics, you know, how it can help us with insight generation, you know, hopefully enhancing and accelerating data governance and quality, um, you know, so that 
you can focus on some of the things that machines can't do yet. So it's still going to be all about garbage in, garbage out here, and definitely using, you know, some decision science brain to make it happen. Business users, I want you guys to know, hey, there are tools out there. I'm okay with trying them out. I don't need to have deep expertise and I can leverage them and I can really focus. If there's anything I want people to walk away with and you see, I haven't talked about what decision science is, another nebulous term, maybe a future one, I don't know. But at the end of the day, this is all about, you know, finally our dreams of, as data professionals is coming true. And with AI and augmented analytics, it's going to get us closer and closer to be able to actually ensure that we're making better decisions and helping the business drive forward. And as a leader, I mean, part of one of the hardest things to do, as probably most of us on here know, um, as we've been trying to do data and AI things is like, how do I actually use this to deliver results? How do I tell the story internally so that I can get investments so that we can go try to do some of these cutting edge techniques? So this is my goal. I want you to walk away with this. Hopefully all the homework I've done and the experience I've had is something that helps to accelerate, you know, whatever you're looking to do in this space. So how I'm going to go through it, you can't have a data management call or a data professional call without talking about concepts and definitions, right? So we'll start with those just to kind of get on the same page. We'll talk about benefits, risks, and mitigation strategies. And then how do you, how can you get started? You know, how do people on this call get started? How do you think about getting your organization a head start? And then of course, again, I will try to look at if you have questions or comments as we go, I'll look at them, but definitely populate that Q&A because we'll have some time at the end. Um, but also do not be afraid to just punch some questions in um, to the chat. I am not afraid of that and neither is Mark. So let's get into it, key concepts and definitions. But of course, oh, we got the question mark things. All right, and it's kind of a cheeky way to ask it, but you know, have you heard of augmented analytics other than the great marketing job Dataversity has done for this? If so, what does it mean to you? And if not, just relax. Even if you do know, like you don't have to say anything, you can just relax. But does anybody want to kind of volunteer in the chat Hey, this is what I this is my perception of what augmented analytics is. There's no right or wrong. This is changing, but feel free to type in to the chat. Hey, have you heard of it? And if you have heard of it, you know, tell me what you think it is. And I'm terrible with dead air, so I'll make sure that I don't linger too much. Um, yep. Mark, always good at helping me out as I'm like, oh, please. Um, if you have your hand raised, uh, it's probably better to just put it in the chat. I'm not sure, Harshada. Um, anybody else want to volunteer? Automation and AI. Thank you, Abdul. Anyone else? All right, that's okay. I'm going to assume they're all no's, or I'm going to assume you're going to do the teal here is just relax, which is fine. I'm here to do the work. So here's here's something for us to latch on to. Yes, it is the use of AI and machine learning to enhance data analytics processes. So if we look at these four areas where it can help, you know, and you can see a way to see and Abdul, you said automation, and I'm going to say we're automating some things, but we're more like accelerating things. So that's a lot of people say automated data preparation. I'm saying it accelerates it, right? Like if we can use you know, AI and ML to kind of do some faster ETL, do some faster quality profiling, all that good stuff. Great. Um, but I'm still going to always keep the human in the loop. Two, embedded and automated insights. Those are distinct things, but I think it's, it's just something that we're going to dive deeper into. Three, hey, can I finally just ask, ask Watson exactly what um, I want to know, whether it's asking about an insight or doing a query now with the power of LLMs, we have definitely more of, you know, a ability to just talk naturally to a computer. Computer, um, and then finally, I think AI and ML democratization. You know, there 
we all, everybody on here probably knows how hard it is to get AI and ML to work. And it's very high bar into who can actually do it. Well, the nice stuff here is it's becoming more and more available and, you know, kind of crosses over into different areas. But I would be amiss if I did not just mention that it does democratize AI and ML. So let's go a little bit deeper into those four. Number one, automating aspects of data preparation, including our favorite transformation, governance, and quality, right? So there is pl there are plenty of different, you know, um, applications here. You'll see that I'm not calling out any specific platform. I think this is so new. We kind of all know of the platforms that do stuff really well. Um, again, it's garbage out, but there is a ton of like, you can normalize, you can do quicker transformation. You can automate a lot of that. And by the way, if you've used, definitely, if you used any of this in your work, since I know this is a big focus of the community, if you if you use AI ML to help you with either either one of these three, feel free to, you know, stick it in the chat. Like, you know, talk to each other is fine. I think in the future, what we're going to see is like, it's going to become more real time and it won't be as, you know, they're, they're getting there, but a lot of these transformation tools, yeah, they're visual, but barely, right? So I, I think in the future, it's going to be a lot, the interfaces are going to be a lot more easier to work with. And it will be more and more real time as we start to get, you know, deeper into this. Data governance, man, wouldn't that be great? Um, automating all of the compliance security and, you know, the metadata. I think, I think we see a lot of this. I think a lot of us are familiar with these tools on this call. Um, I would really like to see, you know, applications. And I, I don't I don't know they're there yet, but like I believe the hardest thing to do in data governance is to get a quality business definition of data things. So I would love to see an application on that side, but a lot of it, and you see it in, in the stuff coming out through fabric and, and things of this nature is definitely just trying to, you know, make policies easier because right now in the AI age, and I talked a bit, a little bit about it before you are dealing with not only just structured tabular data, but you're dealing with data everywhere and you're dealing with, you know, unstructured data or content like documents, because now we can talk to documents. Um, you know, that, Antoine, uh, I love that question about rules versus AI. I was just talking about how, um, and here's the use case that I was talking about it with, but, you know, if you've ever gone to try to get a loan from a bank, a mortgage, maybe for a car or automobile or something like that, or maybe something cooler like a motorcycle, that's not something I can do because my wife won't let me. But if you think about how hard it is to get matched to the right loan, that's a very hard thing to do. And there are pure AI applications where you're just kind of hard coding numbers, right? But on the back end, there are all these business rules. And I think your point, um, Antoine, just around that is, yeah, I think there's you know, a place for you know, business rules engines, whatever we want to call them, automation engines, things like that, workflow. It's workflow plus AI. How do we kind of mesh those together? So yeah, definitely a great call out. What the mix is, you know, I think we'll see. I tend to say, um, you know, it'll become less and less rules and more and more AI, but, you know, the rules teach the AI how to detect the patterns and and run things. So right now I would say, you know, most of the, most of, most things are being driven by rules. Um, and AI is nice to have there to kind of accelerate some of the harder, more manual things to do. And then data quality, I think we all kind of uh, are aware of this. The, there's a ton you can do with AI and ML as it relates to just, you know, looking at uh, patterns and identifying anomalies, like very, very good here. You know, again, more of the stuff that we're going to see is further and further towards the real time. So I say this to my friends of 
in data governance and management and product building. Our jobs are going nowhere because this still doesn't solve for, you know, the logical kind of, and architects, like this doesn't solve for the patterns and kind of the business context that need to be collected to actually make this work. So, but it is there for us. And I, I would love to see uh, professionals like myself in the data governance space use it more to kind of get get to some of those things that we just have a really hard time doing, which is usually getting, you know, business metadata. Embedded and automated insights. All right. So, you know, these have been around. They're not brand new, right? But let's just think about this, like embedded insights. So say you're using any application and it automatically kind of tells you, hey, did you know this? Like, I think Microsoft Viva is one of those things they're trying to do embedded insights and in just what you use to work day to day. Um, I think in the future, we're going to have a lot more just, hey, you know, did you know I was I was reading into some of the work around Apple intelligence today? And a lot of it is going to come down to how much how much can we kind of program and provide metadata to AI bots or agents so that it can properly read and interpret and suggest or recommend what the next step might be. That's all going to come down to this. And I know we have a big, big, big um, group here that does this work. So this, the quality of this, the availability of this, process engineering, all of that will come into. Um, Darcy, say more about that. You know, the chicken and the egg is definitely... You know, I'll tell you my interpretation of what you said. I've always thought that if you give me a good definition of what data is supposed to be, I can give you a good data quality check that's probably way more powerful. I think what could be interesting um, is when you get into the data quality aspects that are more around um, contextual or looking at multiple um, data elements in a group, you know, starting to do more relational things. AI probably could help a ton, but would love to know. Um, yeah, you got it. Uh, Belly bore. I'm going to try to say your name, but I might get it wrong. But definitely garbage in, garbage out. So like I said, we are totally safe here as uh, data professionals. Um, automated insights. I think this is kind of cool. Just thinking that you could maybe you know, load data into a platform and it come out with just some insights, you know, right away. Um, it's going to be domain driven. So I think there's still going to be work to be done. It's not going to be, you know, a one size fits all, but just think about how you might be able to, you know, set up data, set up metadata and kind of have an AI bot look through things. I think we're going to see more and more of this in platforms. Again, these are all very chunky right now, but they will get better. And then I think, you know, if there's anything, right, this whole thing about real time, which, you know, every time somebody asks me, oh, I need real time data, it's like, well, no, you need just in time data. And oftentimes that's not real time. It may be close to real time, but many times it's just, you know, yeah, if it's event driven, then just tell me when this thing happens. Um, one of the things I like to think of AI as helping in all of this is just speeding up. You know, I know everybody on this call, you know, has has the logical mind to understand how to extract insights and understand how to interpret data. However, the time it takes us to do it can be longer. So how do we leverage AI to just make us be able to do things, you know, just in time? And I, I do think one of the nice things is that the supercomputers, although not as smart as us, if we point it in the right direction, um, it can really help us accelerate the speed to value that we can deliver. So we will see more of that. Natural language analytics. I, I'm really excited about this. I think that this is one of, you know, if we think about AI as AI's core, and especially with large language language models, large you know, vision models or computer vision models, like the idea that instead of me needing to, you know, learn Python or, you know, learn SQL, 
somebody can just kind of query data in a natural language and then find insights, like ask questions. There's been attempts at this and we all know of really bad applications of it. And uh, feel free to like, you know, pile in sometimes where, oh, I tried, I remember I tried Watson back in the day when they said, oh, you can just go and ask a question. That did not go very well. I think it's going to be better just because of the availability um, and where large language models are. And one of their core strengths is taking and translating language, even if it might be into a programming language. So the idea is somebody could do a data query, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, it's going to be chunky. Uh, people are still going to have to have the basic concepts of what to do, but it could be super interesting one day if you can just start to um, do a lot of this without having to understand. Um, Elizabeth, yep, there you go. It's a, That's funny. Um, Douglas, Elizabeth might have uh, just answered one of your questions. Um, I think we've seen like there's a click version, right, of natural language insight. Click does it. Um, they're all trying to do it. Power BI is trying to do it. Um, like I said, Watson is trying to do it. I've heard Watson has gotten better. I have not tested it. But this idea that you can actually, you know, one, go get this data for me. I mean, speak nicer to the computer than that, even though it's a computer. And two, like, can you tell me, you know, what what is the thing that seems to be shutting down my machine over and over again? You know, if you're in a manufacturing situation, could be really cool. Um, they're going to be, I mean, these are blunt. The, the best way to put it is these are all very blunt instruments today. Um, you know, like if you want to be on the cutting edge of some of this stuff, you're going to be looking towards the large, the largest models, right? So, you know, we all know that uh, GPT-40 can do some visualization. It's not great, but man, it does paint a picture of if you could really get your metadata in a good place, it could do some cool stuff. Um, so if you want some platforms, you know, I can definitely help with it. Elizabeth, thank you. You're on it. That's I love to see when the community works together. Um, and then Darcy, yes, thank you for the chicken and the egg. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, AI hallucinations. So I'm going to, that's a big one I think people talk about. And let's, let's talk about that for a second. Um, yes, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> for helping me out. That's perfect. Um, and Douglas, if you need more, um, we can definitely look into that for you. But most of the big platforms, it's happening, whether or not you're seeing it or not. Um, but let's talk about AI hallucinations for a second. You know, those really proliferated when people went and asked, you know, chat GPT, you know, very specific questions. And what you're doing in that scenario is you are asking a model that was trained on a lot of data to answer a very specific question. Now, the models can do that, but that is not their strength. Their strength is understanding what you're asking, converting it into something that can be used to actually find the right answer, find the right answer in the right data set, and then answer it back in natural language. So when we think about, you know, AI models, they've been trained on the internet. They've been trained on what, DSM-4. They've been trained on, you know, <laughs> our constitution, all that good stuff. Because it can, if you look up how these AI models work, you know, they do, oh, it's almost like when you're going to go to college and you did SAT or ACT, they score well in different areas, right? I think, you know, one, data quality is definitely, if you don't have data quality, if you don't have, you know, explainability, if you don't have good semantic layer, like we all have been telling users forever on here, I know, you're going to get some weird answers. And that's 1000% true. So thanks for, uh, thanks, Darcy, for doing that. I think if we just think about, um, 
these large AI models as a way to understand the world more like we do, whether it's language or vision or speech, right? But it doesn't make them an expert in, you know, wherever you guys work, such as retail or e-com or whatever it is. Um, think of it that way. And then, you know, a lot of that will kind of go away. I haven't, you can get hallucinations, but um, that's usually because you're trying to do something that it shouldn't do. Um, ooh, that's a great question, Elizabeth. Um, you're 100% true. Like, so, you know, and I'll, I'll keep going here, but I'm going to, um, because guess what? It democratizes it, which makes it dangerous. And you've probably seen something, uh, a table like this, but I'll at least give you something else to look at because these questions are great and I'll go through this. But, um, you know, there are ways to make, you know, natural language and large models not kind of just make stuff up. One thing is called temperature. So if you guys want, you should look into um, how you set the temperature and the temperature when you turn it one way, it basically says, do not make anything up and do not be creative and be robotic. And then you might go, oh, I should just use a regular search. Yeah, you might have to do it if the temperature is too low. Um, if you turn it all the way there, it gets super creative. Um, if you've been using GPT, chat GPT since it was released to the public, you know, in the big release, you have seen it go from making a lot of stuff up, answering questions that are unsavory or dangerous to not doing that and saying, I can't do that. So there are ways, you know, it is called, you know, whether you want to call it, it used to be called prompt engineering. It's called prompt tuning now. So there is, you know, between prompt tuning, which is telling the model what to do and not to do very specifically for your use case and fine tuning or rag architecture, you can set up a way to prevent hallucinations and things like that. Um, where should Python be? I mean, Python is done within AI, AI platforms. Um, so when I think about traditional old school, we're gonna do data science, you know, that's that's where Python is being used. Um, Python is being used in some of the AI foundation models. Although what you'll see in this table is really, and you can see the intended user, business user, business user, power business user, user AI solution developers, what's that? I, I made that up, but at the same time, I know it exists. And an AI solution de developer is someone who's not, doesn't write Python necessarily, not, not an expert in writing Python and queries and, you know, traditional machine learning techniques, but can configure a service, can do some prompt tuning, can set up a rag architecture. There are, so what you see and why I put this out there is the democratization, it's even more and more important that us on this call, if a lot of our business users aren't here, if a lot of our AI solution developers aren't on, and it's mostly our, us data peeps talking, is that you know there are so many opportunities now for people to start using AI and ML, and we have to be the ones that try to help guide them on what to do and what not to do, right? Um, and that's really what it comes down to. So that's a, it's a great question, Antoine. I mean, I would expect our AI solution developers to be able to do some Python, but also they're building applications with AI. A lot of this is just, it's kind of crazy. And when I say that augmented analytics and AI and ML is pushing things more and more towards the business, this is what I mean. Like we still need to be involved to make the data good. Um, we still need to be involved to do, you know, guidance on how to use certain models or how to use certain applications. We need to help fine tune models. <laughs> we should be really good at prompt engineering or understanding what that is. But a lot of things are happening at the application level. That's what's that's what's happened is is pushing it up. 
So it's very important, you know, for all of us to kind of understand that, yeah, you know, the data that we might be putting together or giving or the models that we might, you know, start using, you know, one, you know, get a little bit um, more T-shaped and be able to do a couple different things here. And two, just understand that one of the reasons I think, um, you know, AI has failed for the most part, you know, up until, you know, recently, and it's still failing, it'll still continue to fail. I think I've showed the stat that, you know, like about 90% of AI things never make it into production. It's the experience is wrong. The data is crap. It's all the same stuff, you know, and right now the, the bar to being able to get those things right is, is getting lower and lower. Um, you know, and I see that, uh, Douglas is writing a little bit in, in the chat, just around, um, detailed prompts. Like there, there are best prompt writing is a thing and you can, and they have pushed it into R and Python so that, you know, it's becoming more and more um, accessible to traditional data scientists. Um, but yes, the more detailed you are, the more examples you give, the better off you're going to be. And really, all I'm saying, and I hate to say it, but like this augment augmented analytics thing is really just, hey, you can use AI uh, to do a lot of things around data and analytics that were really hard to do before. And it's just going to be put more pressure on data management professionals. I mean, we, we, we need to continue to talk about, you know, data quality, good prompting, good, you know, good semantic layers, all those things that we already know we have to double down on because people are going to, people are going to build things. They are failing. There's a lot of POCs being built. It's not working. People are using things like Copilot. Um, they're using things like Gemini, and it's not exactly hitting. It's doing very well at creating content and doing some basic things. It's not doing very well at some of these things like augmented analytics. So, you know, there there's a huge spot for data professionals to help, you know, to help others really activate this. Um, so let's talk about it. And I think you guys have done a really good job of identifying some of the risks for sure. Let's talk about um, the benefits, right? Enhanced decision-making. I, I talked about this, like to be able to make better decisions. I believe, my firm belief is that data really exists to inform decisions. Now, that's where the value is. Everything we do before we make a decision is a cost. So I think making better decisions, capturing the data to learn and make better decisions over time, that's what this can do is how do we, I think, you know, a lot of us on here at least, you know, we've spent our careers trying to encourage people to be data driven. You know, and there's been a lot of, you know, disappointment and, oh, my data's broke, my data doesn't work. You know, are people still making decisions that are more gut feel than data, than data driven? Yes. You know, but the hope, you know, and these are the good things, right? The hope is that better decision making. If we can get more people using data things, leveraging AI to, you know, lower the bar, have them ask some questions and support them, going to make better decisions. You're going to drive the business forward. Part of that too, all right, we're making better decisions and we're using data to do that. We can democratize it. Now you, now this is the flip side is a risk to every benefit, right? But the idea that hey, we can create data marts and we can let people interact with it. You know, how do we do it safely? How do we do it in a way that, you know, um, is is safe and not misinterpreted? Well, I, th I think that comes down to, you know, just the data management aspect and, and how well we define these things, how well they're explained, right? So the idea that we can have people get value through making better decisions 
and have people touching more data um, is, is important. Third, data and analytics efficiency. This is mostly for our crew on here, right? The idea that we can use AI and ML to just be more efficient in things that take a very, very long time and are way underappreciated. We got to find ways to do that. And there are really cool ways, to, you know, to do this, even if you think about just, you know, the basics, um, you know, stuff that is going on, you know, Antoine, so you have a question, but, you know, Databricks, the reason that they're so popular is that Unity catalog is pretty awesome. The way that it kind of can automatically do a lot of things that are hard in a workflow, that's why it's so popular. So Antoine, you know, you just have to think about a big cloud provider and there is some sort of augmented analytics. So if I think about, you know, what's going on with Power BI and Copilot, and the fact that you can do so much in Fabric that is more or less like low to no code, uh, visual and or natural language, this is all, it's all driven by AI. Um, and I, I keep going back to what I always loved, you know, in my data strategy science, you know, deep times is really like, hey, Unity catalog is amazing. Um, yeah, like, and, and Elizabeth, great question there, I think. And just to say it out loud for the people watching the recording, um, just asking about AWS. One of the reasons I don't list anything on here is that, you know, in certain ways, everybody's doing the same thing, right? So it's hard to say, you know, Microsoft's the biggest, right? And they have the huge, huge footprint in corporate America. They have partnered with the best, you know, AI crew and, you know, they're doing some really interesting things when we think about, you know, Fabric and we think about Copilot. But then you look at Google and they have tremendous capabilities too, right? They have Gemini, they've had uh, Vertex AI, and they've had all sorts of AI driven things. And you just think about what did Google become famous for? Search. Their search is one of the best searches. I mean, and now it's available to people. And then when you think about AWS, they're very, they're a sleeping giant is what I would say, Elizabeth. Like they have good tools. Um, it all comes down to if you can, if your organization is ready to use them or if you can find a partner that can help you leverage them. I think that that's true with AWS. And then I've mentioned Databricks. You know, you can start to talk about Snowflake. All of these big players in this space, Data Robot, um, you have, you know, Data, Data Coup. Like there's a lot of folks doing pretty cool stuff in this space. It all kind of comes down to, at a certain point, you know, marketing <laughs> of who gets you know, notice the most or what they're actually really delivering. Um, and I think AWS does a tremendous job delivering great cloud services. Obviously their algorithm works because they're making, they are making available all the stuff that they use internally. Um, but again, I think it was the chicken or the egg thing, right? Um, I'll say chicken in this case might be, you know, the capabilities to be able to use the tools and, you know, the, uh, the egg would be the actual um, use of them. So do you have the people to build it? And do you have the use case and the data um, and the tools to do it? So that's kind of why I don't necessarily list out all of them because I'll end up missing some and I probably did. Um, you know, yeah, like Scott brings up micro strategy. I mean, that was that was the data statistician thing before, you know, so much came up. So it's right now it's really a race of who can who can tie all this stuff together. Um, but at the end of the day, organizations will always run into the idea that it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, and do they have the capability to be able to do it? Um, I think a lot of places 
where data science projects fail, it's because they just don't have the people or the talent to maybe they they build it, but what do I do with it afterwards? Or, you know, did I connect it to the business? You know, there, there's a lot in there. So great questions, keep them coming. You know, what are the risks? All right, now we're just gonna give all our data to AI, right? So privacy and security is huge. Think about bias and inaccuracy. You know, like these things will just go back to the patterns. Um, it doesn't even have to be malicious. It doesn't have to be, oh, Power BI wants me to know that it's, it's just, it's the way it's, it's the way humans are with initial bias based on experience and, you know, how accurate it is. And then probably the biggest one that I just want to throw out there is an over-reliance on automation. I saw something where the CEO of JP Morgan was bragging about they're using AI and everything. No, they're not, first of all. And second of all, if they do that, they're going to have a big, big problem because, you know, <clears throat> nobody quite knows. <clears throat> excuse me. Nobody quite knows where automation should stop and humans should start and vice versa. So it, you got to be very careful, very careful. Um, how do I think organizations and people should think about mitigating that? It's have a strategy, like lit, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? Who's going to use these, you know, augmented analytics tools? Like you, don't just implement it carte blanche. Like it's crazy. It keeps happening. It's great to go all in when you're in Rounders the movie and you win the big pot and you know, everybody likes the World Series of Poker. But all in when we're talking about like transformational technology it's just bad practice. Get a strategy. You know, make sure your data is good. Um, you know, what's the governance frameworks? We we all know this. And the third one, I harp on this all the time as well. It's not just, is it good data and have we governed it? Do we know where we're going to deliver value and how? But it is also, do our people know how to use it? Do they trust it? Do they understand it? And can they build on it? That comes down to literacy. It, it is the most overlooked piece of all of this. Because if you teach somebody how to think about data, use data, use tools, kind of all of that stuff, it fixes a lot, <laughs> a lot of the other things. <clears throat> all right. So yes, fines will shape people up. I keep waiting for the big one. Let's talk about how you get started. This is a mindset thing, but I think if everybody on here, you should think, how do I use AI first? You have to have an AI first mindset and it's not gonna work sometimes, but it might work. And when it does work, it's awesome. Um, so most organizations, you already have AI built in, you know, in some of, there. there's a surprising number of corporate companies that I've worked with that have access to, it used to be called Ping, Bing Chat. It's called Copilot whatever web. I don't, they don't even have a name for it. Everything's called Copilot. Thanks for confusing us. But at the end of the day, Copilot web is one of the most effective ways to search the internet, period. It provides citations, Edge Copilot. Thank you, Douglas. I want to call you Doug, but I don't know you that way, so I can't do that. It is tremendous. Everybody thinks about like, well, where where is where is this AI coming up with this answer? It does a tremendous job telling you. Um, and it is my go-to when I need to look for something or research something because it gives me clickable links. Chat GPT still struggles with that. Great job by Microsoft doing that. Embrace those. Embrace it. Just see how you can use it. Um, it's kind of like one of those things where, oh, I can, I'm just going to do it myself because I don't have time to teach you. Take the time, you know, treat AI as somebody you're trying to teach how to do things. Good. <laughs> Good to know, Doug. Um, yes. And not only that, but it protects all of your data. It protects what you chat. You choose what to share with it. Um, if there's a hiccup, you can tell it whether it's good or bad. Um, 
explore and experiment. There are so many open source AI things out there. Um, if you're interested or you're in the space and you're not kind of messing with it, you know, you're missing out. I mean, most of these things too have a free trial. You know, you, you can sign up for, you know, Google Cloud and mess around with Vertex. You can mess around with data. Like, it, it's a great way. But if you don't do that, you never really know. Then it all just becomes a knee jerk reaction of what you think. Either you're like too gung ho about it or you're too negative about it. I don't know. Stay up to date. You guys are here. Um, there's so many communities, there's so many, I hate to use this term because I'm old, there's influencers or whatever we want to call them. There are content creators that create terrific, um, just up to date, like Llama just did something today. I haven't been able to <laughs> read about it yet, but Llama just released another model, you know, stay up to date podcasts and stuff like that. Just, just know that this will change our world. And if you have a child like I do, it's going to change their world. I have a six-year-old. I have no idea what Violet, my daughter, is going to be doing for work or what that even looks like. My wife, the dentist, <laughs> they just got AI software to start reading their x-rays. It's going to happen. And we have to, if we're going to be, if we want to take this and we want to be the change in our organizations, we have to have the mindset of thinking AI first. Um, you know, I, I always say, think big, start small, same thing, like do pilots, have a scalable framework so that she can do it and iterate. Don't just say it, it worked or it didn't work. Where do you go next? Always like, and you got to commit, like I put think big and commit fully because everybody should be doing that. We've been talking, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm sure some of you Oh man, they didn't even have analytics when I went to college. Um, you know, but some of you have really been into data science or some of you have been doing it maybe longer than me. May there there's a possibility somebody's older than me. But this whole idea is that like you have to fully commit to it. It is a it is a thing. You know, I'll never forget this is a oh man, a personal story, but maybe this will be a good one for you guys to use. Um, I remember Tiger won Tiger Woods won uh the the Masters in '97, and my grandpa was a big Jack Nicholas fan. He's like, Oh, that that Tiger Woods is just a flash in the pan. Look it up. It's just a it's just a way, if you don't know that old timey thing, it was just a way for you know him to say, ah, oh, he's just you know, he's the flavor of the month or whatever you want to say. AI is not the flavor of the month. This is transforming. It is the Tiger Woods of stuff that we've been looking looking at, just like, you know, the iPhone and things like that. So it's really important to fully commit to it. But that doesn't mean be reckless. Still, still be, you know, still is still try to be a little pragmatic. Um, finally, ask for help, whether it's, you know, I do. <laughs> I ask people things all the time about this. You know, there's formal training. So you're here listening to a Dataversity webinar. There are trainings like it is go get trained, it, go deeper into some of this stuff. Um, it just learning. Yeah, you can listen to me talk at a high level about stuff, but going deeper is even, you know, more effective um, when you're ready. Mitigation strategy consultants. I did want to say consultants, uh, <laughs> um, but I had to. But like there, it, it never fails. You know, I had been in consulting for so long. I'd also been at corporations. I was on both sides of the coin where consultant would come in when I was in a corporation and they would tell me, they would tell my leaders exactly what I told them 80 million times. But they listened to the consultants. It's a nice way. If you don't know where to start, you don't know how to tell the story. It's a great way to get going. And it, you know, when we're talking about mitigating, you know, strategy and you guys as data professionals, you can be internal consultants yourself, but just showing how, yeah, well, if you want to do that, then we have to have a pretty robust literacy program. We need to get our governance and quality and what's our strategy. You guys can all do this on here too. 
And then of course there's implementation augmentation. Uh, that's a mouthful. Sorry about that, but I stand by it. At the end of the day, you know, making sure that you're not spinning your wheels trying to learn something that somebody else could do for you and help teach you, it's it's useful. That's why SIs exist, right? Uh, systems integrators. It's it's really because you know people just do that one thing, and can they come and teach you to do that? So you know, leaning in, um, asking for help when you need it and you know doing starting small those are those are really my big points so as we get into the um dedicated q and a i just want to ask you guys how are you feeling like you could give a thumbs up you could give a i, I don't know if they have a thumb sideways um you could just tell me did i did i help to try to demystify this or explain this so that whatever one or three of these you fit into, you're feeling good. Can you give me anything? And then we can kind of uh, start to look at a Q&A. If I didn't, answer, ask a question and maybe we can get into it in the Q&A. And if I know it, I'll tell you. And if I don't know it, I will figure it out. Right now we don't have any Q&A. No, Elizabeth, you, uh, I, I'm making you assistant presenter because you did a great job um, helping me. So yeah, great. There are, um, there's a guy as we're thinking about names, David Piz Pidsley, I think from Gartner. He, I don't know if he coined this, but he definitely is one of the folks that if you follow him on LinkedIn is always talking through augmented analytics. Um Allie Miller is another great one that is a good follow. Um, yeah. Well, these are good ones for me to check out. Um, I mean, shoot, Mark knows them too. So these these are all good. Any other questions? Um, you know, I know some of our folks are in uh, in Europe, so they probably want to go to bed. Although I was just in Spain. And you guys go to bed very late, some of you, which was terrible for me and my old mind. Mark, I can keep talking forever, but I don't have to. Yeah, no, I, I really like that. And and for me, it really <clears throat> demystified the different angles that, that, that I kind of think about things. Um, because as you know, I'm like an old AI hack from the 90s, and I'm just familiar with all the math and theory from the before times. And I only kind of <laughs> got back into it recently-ish. So I, I had access to the research copy of chat GPT. So back in like the 2.1 days, 2.0. Yeah. And then we used to play with Watson all the time in the in the before times, I think when uh, a certain software vendor had integrated it into their main governance offering at the time, they did a lot of neat things with Watson back then. And it was all kind of wrapped into Cognos at the time. So it's like they were trying to get into this augmented analytics, but it was like yeah. too soon. It's, it's hilarious. We're hearing a lot of words that people, certain people that might be just getting into data are like, what is a Cognos? Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's how times. fast it's working yeah the before <laughs> times exactly uh, well thank you very much Nick for this presentation uh, any last minute questions anybody I so chat. I am I am on LinkedIn uh, Mark I don't know if you're able to pop my thing in there if, I'm I afraid I if I do something I'll you know I'm too old and I'll not share the right screen. Um, but if people <laughs> want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm there and would love to hear from anybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll find you here. There we go. Data and AI. Ooh. Mo, you finally said blockchain. Whew. I think, man, I've been waiting for blockchain to do something. Um, since we have... A minute or two there there's my linkedin thanks mark i don't just have mark do all my dirty work but um <laughs> yeah i heard my one friend works at an insurance company and they're they're using blockchain 
you know, in a very interesting way, you know, kind of, kind of delivering on its promise. So um, I definitely expect something to happen there. And who knows, maybe even the metaverse or, you know, augmented reality will become more of a thing. I think uh, the ability and uh, of these large models that are available to us is unlocking a lot of doors to failed applications before. So, yeah, all right, Mark, if insight. nobody has questions, I'm good. Yeah. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming to this latest installment of, uh, of Nick's uh, webinar series. And we hope to see you again next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, all.